Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hiya! Before we dive into today's exciting episode, I wanted to shine the spotlight on my business and how I help arty, crafty, creative business owners to build a sustainable business. One of the best ways to build a sustainable business is by introducing online courses into your business. And that is my specialist subject. You know, not only do I love textile art and embroidery, but I'm a trained and experienced tech trainer with well over 10 years of online business experience and mentoring experience too. And so perhaps I'm the perfect person to help you move forward with your business. I can help you learn how to create a course. I can help you learn how to improve an existing course or Zoom workshop. I can help you to market. I have a range of courses that covers all of those things. You can also hire me on a one-to-one basis as well. So probably the easiest way to find out more about me would be to pop over to Instagram. You can follow me, susan.l.weeks, or on my Facebook page, the missing training, where there's lots of information and free videos and a a really great free resource to help you get started as well. So why not pop over and say hi? I'm happy to help. And of course, I'm always cheering you on. And now let's dive into this week's episode. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Nikki Parmenter. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Sue. It's brilliant to see you today or have you here as my guest. And yeah, we've had a bit of a, a bit of a summer holiday and I haven't done any for a while. So here we go. Nikki's the first of our, I'm going to call it my new season. There we are. That's, <laughs> that's a good way of getting around the fact that I haven't done one for months. It's a new season. Brilliant. Right then. So Nikki, I have um, a, a bit of a bio um, here from Nikki. And obviously she has her website and she's busy on Facebook as well. And all her links will be in her episode on stitcherystories.com. All right. So now Nikki's got actually quite an interesting background. So I'll, I'll go through her um, bullet points and then we'll, uh, then we'll crack on. So she's got MA and BA degrees in fine art from Manchester Polytechnic. She then went and did a PGCE and taught art for 30 years. And as she said, escaped in 2016. She now exhibits, provides talks and courses, workshops and demonstration in person and via good old Zoom. She provides art textiles workshops for GCSE students. And out of all of this, I think the the main thing is I find very interesting is she is actually a self-taught textile and mixed media artist. She's written articles and projects for online platforms, books and magazines. And she's also supported by Janome for whom she delivers masterclasses at their UK headquarters. She's exhibited widely in solo and group shows and she's got an exhibition coming up that she'll um, be telling us about. Member of a couple of uh, textile groups, Textile 21 and Textile Connections. And as we'll discuss later on, there's a she's got quite a lot of inspirations, which I'll leave for that conversation. And in terms of what <laughs> materials she uses, well, crikey, it's a very long list, so we'll get on with that as well. But in a nutshell, I find Nikki's work to be bright, shiny, colourful, and above all, exuberant. So there we are. That's Nikki in a in a bullet point nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome again, Nikki. Thank you. Right then. So before we get started too much in your story, and I think we are going to have tons and tons of things to talk about, then would you like to share with us, Nikki, what you're working on at the moment and what's got you excited? Well, at the moment, I'm working on several things at the same time. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> My husband refers to it as a scattergun approach. So <laughs> I imagine I'm standing there shooting several projects at the same time. Um, 
I'm working on a very large piece, finishing something off that's been on exhibition at Gawthorpe Hall in Paddingham, in near Burnley. Yeah. And that's a flower power tower. And it's a seven foot high structure, which is based on tulip vases. And the Gawthorpe Hall houses the Gawthorpe Textiles Collection. And because I was showing there, I decided to go to the textile collection for inspiration. So each panel on the Flower Power Tower represents something that I've observed in the collection. Oh, and nice. it was structurally really tricky. I'm lucky because my husband, who's actually trained as a sculptor, helps with anything structural. <laughs> um, I've had one or two little disasters, uh, well, not disasters, but mishaps where mm. I, I've got a very clear idea in my head of what I want to make. So I go ahead and make it and forget that it might have to fit together or it might need a wooden armature. Yeah. So, um, so he's great at saying, no, hang on a minute. We need to actually make this structure first and then you can then you can decorate it. So he's really fantastic at, at doing that angle. Oh, that's yeah. really handy. And um, handy. just to just to show there's, there is one of the, obviously I've got a selection of Nikki's work that I'll be sharing on Facebook and uh, of course on Instagram on the Stitcher Stories channel. But uh, it was interesting for you to say your flower power tower is seven foot tall. I mean, it looks quite tall, but I had no idea it was actually seven foot tall. So yeah, it definitely, it's, that's yes. really handy that you've got somebody to um, do the construction side of things. Brilliant. Yeah, another thing is because he's got an art background, I use yeah. him as well to, to advise me. So I always ask him, do you think this is working? And he usually tells me if it isn't. Um, and it, it, it's fantastic to have that, you know, that uh, opportunity to oh, get that, feedback straight away. Yeah, that really is. And you say with somebody who's got an art, an artistic oh, yes, background yes, rather yes. than us just asking our, you know, mum or husband or yes. whatever, and they'll go. Say, oh, it's lovely. That's lovely. Very <laughs> yes. good to you. But the other thing, the other thing that is great is that he really likes cooking and he likes listening to Radio 4. So he listens to Radio 4 and cooks while I do some stitching. Oh, do you know, everyone will be queuing up. They'll be nicking your husband <laughs> off you. Yeah. Well, people ask me, where did you find him? <laughs> Oh, he, is, he is very supportive which is great oh that really makes such a difference doesn't it it, it really definitely. does yeah yes. I know with just being a, a single mum myself sometimes you just think oh god I can't be bothered to do cooking today you know I'm I'm, I'm, I'm bored I don't want to do any but then, uh, yeah that oh that's really brilliant that's great that's yeah great. and um, another thing I'm in the process of assembling is a piece called the conference of the birds which is the second image in a triptych which is going to be shown at Chester Cathedral in June 2022, with the time in the Textile 21. The, the three pieces are quite large. There's one that's going to be on the podcast, uh, which yeah. is called The Wild Swan. Right, and that's yes. based on a poem by W.B. Yeats. And it's a large piece. It's five feet square. Right, five feet. Yeah, you, you are working on a big scale here, aren't you? Well, I suppose yes. in the cathedral you have to, don't you? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just prefer a larger scale. And the, the, the downside to that is every time I make something big, I want to make something bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what people find interesting. I think there's this, this notion that textiles or embroidery, whatever people call it, it, it's perhaps not particularly large in scale sometimes. And I think mm. people are quite surprised at the scale of the work when they see it in person. And I yeah. just I just love working on that larger scale because quite often it's only a series of smaller things that have been put together to make a larger thing. So, um, you know, I, I just like to make lots of separate items and then I eventually assemble them. So the bird piece, I've got 30 birds that need to be put together. <laughs> and it's a seven foot tall piece. Um, my problem at the moment, pra- just practical problem is I've got a, a new puppy. And so I couldn't possibly work on the floor because it would eat the bird. Eat it, yeah. So I'm going to have to go and go to a, a, another venue, perhaps my mum's living room, where I can put the things together. So practically, it can be quite challenging and physically quite difficult as well to put a large piece under the sewing machine. Mm. So it's like wrestling with a great big bundle of fabric sometimes, but um, it's worth it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no, I'd, I'm really pleased that you mentioned, I mean, I normally kind of ask about the scale because we see a picture on Instagram and, you know, and of course we formatted it to be square as well. And then you look at it and and basically you have got zero idea if this thing is five feet, five inches, five millimetres. You've just got no idea, have you? So, no, it's yeah, impossible. it's impossible to tell. So it, that's why I really like to get the work out and to get it seen because yeah, it, it yeah. does look when it's all together, you know, it does look really quite dramatic. Mm. Um, I had an exhibition 
at the Williamson Art Gallery in Birkenhead in 2019, and I had 43 pieces in there, I think, <laughs> all of them textile and mixed media. And there was one man who walked through and he, he said, what am I looking at? He didn't quite know what they were <laughs> made of. I think people are quite interested in the materials and that sort of thing, but quite often they, they don't really know what to make of it sometimes. Yeah. So um, I like to explain to people how they're made, and I really like educating people as well and, and showing people through workshops and things like that so you know I find it fascinating using all these different materials it's really interesting yeah right we'll, we'll come on to the materials later but mm. you're so right about people don't know what it is that they're actually looking at you know no. a few past guests have, have mentioned that I mean I think when people you say embroidery then some people have got this fixed idea of granny's tea trays and those oh, kind yes. of things you know which is probably all they've ever seen yeah. um and, and and really just have no idea of all the other things that can be done with fabric and thread and yeah I think for them to try and understand what are, what they are looking at and what it is made out of and the size of the things or the the subject matter you know brings brings back the idea that we always say is well textile art is art it's a different medium but it's still art but I think yeah. so many people just can't they can't get the head around what it is that they are as you say what what, what am I looking at yes. here yes. yeah well in in schools now they've stopped doing textiles technology and they've moved on to a GCSE in art textiles so the emphasis has changed quite a lot on that so maybe people will come through schools with a slightly different understanding mm. of what art textiles are but it's certainly a lot more creative than the previous very technical spec so that's quite interesting and I've done quite a few workshops in schools for textiles teachers who ne haven't necessarily got that same fine art background because I think that's where I'm at an advantage because I've had all of that of that background and I used to go with my parents to abroad on holiday and see galleries and churches mm. and all sorts of things so I've always had that kind of background of looking at different cultures and artifacts and you know art galleries so it's, it's second nature to me really to, to be interested in things like that yeah yeah and you, you can you can see that although you said there that um you, you know you taught art for 30 years and then escaped you haven't really escaped, have you? You've escaped location. No, no. You've changed the location. No, yes, but the, yeah. the, your love of teaching and your love of getting people interested in, in textile art, however, whatever you want to call it, is very, very strong. That comes across very, very strongly. So, yes. yeah. Yeah, I, I like to, to explain to people how, how things can be made. Mm. And it's, it's very satisfying if you do a workshop and people are genuinely – surprised with what they've done or yeah. just astonished at the type of materials and they say oh I never thought I could use it for that and yeah. they go away thinking um, you know diff thinking differently from how they came into the session so it's really satisfying actually it's lovely to do yeah right well I'm, I'm, I'm dying to ask you about some of those techniques and things so obviously I can tell that you are really excited about the work that you're doing you know obviously you've you, You've explained there you've come through from the, the fine art background and then finished up teaching art. And, and then you, you also said there that you're self-taught in terms of textiles and, and mixed media. So how, yeah. how, how did that all fit together? You know, how, how did you actually start getting involved in the fabric and thread side of things rather than the paint you know the traditional yeah. kind of fine art paint and paper kind of thing yeah well I've always been very interested in in art my grandfather mm. was actually an art teacher when he, he was an author and so his his abilities come through to me really oh, and right. I always used to do my own work in the evenings when I was teaching full-time mm -hmm. and I, I initially did a lot of work on paper uh, it was based on Tibetan mandalas quite a lot of it because I do tend to like quite decorative flat patterned pieces yeah and so I did lots of work on paper based on these and then eventually I thought hang on a minute I, I want to do something that goes beyond the paper the paper was too two-dimensional and I wanted something a bit more mm. so I had a chat with my husband Steve and he suggested perhaps you use wood instead to make some pieces that, that were more shaped so I started to use MDF which we cut into different shapes and layered up so I was coming away then from the flat surface into more yeah. relief but because I tend to like to work on a large scale eventually they got too big to, to, or too heavy to carry <laughs> um, and it was really 
not satisfactory at all. So yeah, at that yeah. point, probably in about 2005, I just had a look around for, for some books and I found Fused Fabrics by Margaret mm. Deal and also Paper, Metal and Stitch. Um, I think was that Maggie Gray. So I looked through those and they were fantastic. And I think the, the one that really caught my imagination was the Fused Fabric one. And that explains the technique very briefly where you take a piece, piece of felt, you layer on top of that pieces of organza, um, synthetic fabrics, chiffons, and then on top of that, you put a top layer of netting. Mm. And then you get a soldering iron and you score through that sandwich of fabrics. The soldering iron melts the fabrics together. And then that gives you a piece of, of layered fabric that, that you can then put under your sewing machine and you can use it as a background. You've got to stitch it quite thoroughly, use yeah. it as a background, or you can make it into something like a fish or a bird or a flower. And once I'd found that technique, I was off with that. Yeah. Um, I also like the metal aspect of it. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, um, I actually began to see all of these other possibilities but I did buy my first sewing machine online, um, I think, again, 2005. And this thing arrived in a box. It was a Janome sewing machine. And at school, uh, we, we did very little textiles. I made a nightie and a skirt, although I should actually say my mum made it for me because I didn't <laughs> at all. So the sewing machine stayed in the box for I mean, quite literally about a month because it just to me it was a very complicated machine that I had no chance of, of mastering mm, mm. so imagine how amazed I was when I did manage to to thread it and, and make it work hey. um, so you know it was a revelation <laughs> I, I still find if it's working fine it's working but if the tension goes or something like that I'm tearing my hair out yeah. so um mm-hmm. you know they are quite challenging but I use a genome and also um Benina and they're very basic. They've got no programming in. They're just simple stitching. Yeah. I don't think I could manage with a machine which had all sorts of pre-programmed per, um, mm-hmm. um, images. I don't like that. So anyway, I've mastered it. Um, and initially I used just a straight sewing machine foot. I had a go with free machine embroidering, oh, perhaps about 2008 uh, with my daughter's m- um, machine. But literally two minutes into the stitching, the, the needle broke. So from that time, <laughs> as I decided I can't do free machine embroidery. And I didn't touch it again for 10 years. <laughs> and then in, in around about 2018, I, I just took to it again and found that I, I was really quite adept at, at sewing with thread, which is what, what I call it. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. so I, I just love that technique. I think it's, it, it's a fantastic technique to use. Yeah. So there's been a lot of experimenting and things not quite going to plan and so forth but yes, yeah yes, yeah I think you, you, and error. Yeah, yeah exactly and you've developed quite a distinctive look to your work now as well as I say you know the kind of things I, I've, I've noted down here very bright shiny colorful and exuberant I thought just kind of summed, <laughs> summed it all up but yeah it's it's I love the bit when you said you're assembling all these small pieces. You do all these small pieces and then together they make a big piece. And that's yeah. a brilliant a brilliant way of looking at it rather than feeling overwhelmed. Yes. I mean, if I'm doing a large piece, what I do is I make all the small pieces first and I keep them in a bag. Yeah. And then when everything's done, I put it out <laughs> together on the floor and decide if I've got enough. <laughs> so I just accumulate. I would never think, well, well, here's a, a six foot piece. I'm going to stitch this one piece on now and then I'll, I'll stitch more on when it's finished. Yeah. It's very much, um, it develops as it goes along. People right. quite often say, do you, do you sketch out a composition? And I don't really. Um, mm. I have a, a notion in my head of what I want it to be like. Yeah. And then I go about achieving that. But because things can change along the way I think it's quite a good thing not to have a very fixed idea because then you can just respond to other things that that you come across yeah yeah that's really great to hear that and I think people find that quite inspiring in that yeah sometimes we work small because we don't know how to do anything else we it's scary it feels scary to do something bigger so I think by breaking it down into that well it's actually a big thing made up of lots of small things. If you're going to do fish, make loads of fish and then see where you go from there. So I think that really, I think people would find that quite helpful. So yes, certainly yes. it's, you know, I I have, but again, I'm not, I don't quite like the fiddly of small things either. I think big things you can, uh, you don't have to be quite as fiddly, do you really? <laughs> so. Well, you can be more kind of broad brush marks with it. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But you can only um, 
can only stitch on a certain amount at a time under the needle, can't you? So I just think, well, I'll stitch on this bit and I'll stitch some more and some yeah. more. And eventually, yeah. you, know, you get to quite a large scale piece. A large piece, yeah. And then all, all, all the kind of logistical problems that that brings again, working yes. back on a large scale. So, yes. yeah. So you mentioned there about um, having travelled quite a bit and, um, you know, being interested in different styles of art. And I think your inspirations there, you know, we've got there's a lot of mythology going on there, isn't there? And uh, I know you've mentioned about symbolism and various other pieces. What else have we got down here? Art, architecture, history, stories, literature, cultures, religion, flora and fauna. It sounds like something out of Mastermind, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think because I've got quite a fine art background, I yeah. tend to look at artists quite a lot I don't particularly look at textile artists strangely mm. because I don't well I do know who some of them are obviously but I tend to go more for fine art as inspiration or ah. um I particularly like and also mythology and yeah. stories and things like that so um yeah it's it's just um a, a broad range of influences really and I'm, I'm never strict for anything to do um <laughs> I'd, I'd never I'd, I'd never reach a stage where I'd be thinking oh what am I going to do now yeah it's more a case of I've got all these things to do now. How am I going to fit all these into my working life? Really? <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, you know, I'm, I think I'm, I'm lucky that I've also always got something clicking away in my head, thinking what, what will the next project be? So I just find it very exciting. It's, it's just a way of life, really. Yeah. I, I do some work every day. It's very rare that I would have a day when I didn't do anything. Yeah, right. So, so that uh, since it is all, you're full of inspiration and excited about what you're doing, have you therefore suffered from like a creative block or um you know just kind of lost your stitching mojo as anything like that happened and if so you know what did you do to get around it or maybe yeah. it hasn't happened occasionally it does um, yeah. what the, the the thing i struggle with are faces yeah, um, right. and so on some pieces i might try particularly if profiles i might try several profiles and then just throw them away because they've not worked. So I think the figures I find quite difficult. So they they may well get thrown into the bin. Yeah. <laughs> but what I tend to do is if I'm stuck on something, I just simply move on to something else. Right. Um, there's always, uh, always something else to do, always. Yeah. So uh, fortunately, I don't really have any kind of block particularly. I just I just put it to one side and, and do something else. Ah, right, just sw- switch, switch the subject up and, yes, and get yes. – because yeah, sometimes – it's the very fact of doing something helps us get, you know, the classic thing, isn't it, when someone's unmotivated, the thing that they need to do is just try even for a minute to do something and then that gets your brain going again to want to carry on doing more things so yeah oh definitely yeah. definitely. so do you avoid people <laughs> avoid people you know what I mean do you, <laughs> do you avoid figures in your artwork now as it got to that point you think oh no I'm not doing any more figures oh, or faces no no, no. Um, you keep trying do you yeah no it's just um just recently I was trying to do um a, 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 an image of Ophelia um on the in the water and I yeah. just get the profile right I've, I've done it now if eventually I've, I've actually mastered it but that's the thing that causes me causes me the most frustration right uh, but um any, anything else I'm quite happy with but I think drawing is quite a, an important part well it's a very important part of my work mm. having done um the fine art degree I'm just used to drawing and right. I think that comes across in the work um it does yes did, um an article for Maggie Gray's wow book um and she did an interview with me and she said what was the most important thing and I think drawing is the most important thing because I can draw on paper I can draw with fabric and I can draw with thread so that all links together and I think perhaps that's what makes my work a little bit different is that there is this very strong drawn element in it which is creative with creative with the stitch yeah yeah and and of course then we've probably got half the audience kind of groaning going oh but I'm rubbish at drawing I can't do drawing so I you know uh, therefore uh, I can't do textile art or embroidery and you know no that's not the case at all you don't have to be able to draw to create a really lovely piece of textile art yeah Yeah, you know your, your style is because you love to draw then you've created a style that drawing is important in it yes yes but in my workshops, I, I can provide people with ways to draw um, and be successful. So we use um, tracing or stencils quite a bit. So there's always 
somebody can always do some kind of a drawing. So I, I try to encourage that. And it usually works very well, actually. People do seem quite receptive. So the, the main thing is to make them feel confident that they, they should have a try, particularly Brilliant. with the free machine embroidery. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's just sitting there and doing a little bit for them. And then mm. they sit down and have a go. And it's just them getting over that initial fear of, oh, fear. Yeah, I can't do it. Yeah. 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 It's, just, it's a story, isn't it? We all tell ourselves these stories of what we can and can't do. So, yes. yeah. Now, I'll come back to the um, workshops and stuff. So following on from, we've just been talking there about your inspirations and your, your love of drawing and how strongly that comes through then the, the materials so obviously techniques you've now been working you've got your machine back out again now yes, and yeah. you know there's a, a seem to be a whole range of techniques but particularly this idea of layering things up and yes. heat and manipulating them like that so yes. the, you've got that combination of techniques and materials so do you have like a, a almost a set list of materials that you then just add extra things into you know where did things like pipe cleaners turn up and what else have we got Oh, oh, um, host, host King, King's pan insulation material and building stuff and all sorts. So, <laughs> where, 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 what, what starts, Nikki? Is it your design? You think, how the hell am I going to make this? Or do you think, oh, this is an interesting random thing I've seen in the builders' merchants? What can I do with it? Uh, probably the latter, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I tend to find things and pick them up and think, oh, what could I use that for? Yeah. So, I've even picked up wheel trims from the side of the road. Yeah. Um, I've got, I think, about eight of them in the garage. And I used <laughs> one to mount a piece of work on. So it actually comes away from the wall like a kind of a dome shape. Almost. Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I say just pick things up or be in queue. I, I find being in queue really quite fascinating. Because <laughs> it's got tubing, it's got really nice nylon wire that you can unthread, nylon rope that you can unravel and you can burn it and it distorts. Yeah. Yeah. And all sorts of odds and ends. And, yeah, Kingspan is a, a building material that goes between walls to insulate yeah. it. And it cuts very easily. So, yeah. again, my husband helped to make a piece called Angelus. And that's a kind of shrine piece. And the curved area at the top it's cut from Kingspan, so it's very light and it's very easy to work with. So anything really. I mean, I was in boots a while ago paying for something and then just by the till there were some dental floss um, little harps. <laughs> and I thought, oh, those are nice. Yeah. So I bought those and those are in a piece of work that will feature in this podcast. Um, also things like um, curtain hooks. So I tend to save things and then eventually I think, oh, yeah, I know what I can use that for. Mm. It's better to have it all there. It's like a, a, a loads of ingredients. Yeah. You can just pick out what you think you need. So, yeah, anything. And, and people are always giving me things as well. <laughs> I think see me as a kind of dumping ground yes. things that I don't want anymore. So I usually say yes, even before they've told me what they want to give me. So, so yeah, I've, I've got lots and lots of materials. Which, lots of stuff yeah, to have lots a go of at. Stuff. Yeah, fabulous yes. um yeah so angelus that's one of the photos that um yes. uh, that i'll be sharing and so what size is that then nikki is that large as well um i think it's about three feet in height right. so it doesn't it isn't that large but it's no. just, it's just fairly substantial yeah, yeah um yeah. and that one had all sorts of different materials on it so we've got the king span for the depth of the archways i've also used some pipe insulation for the columns which mm. again is from from being cute it's yeah. A, pl- um, a, a kind of grey polystyrene tube yeah. and I've put ribbon around there to create banded columns mm-hmm. um, I've used a material called funky foam which I use in almost everything which is a brilliant material that you can get from Hobbycraft or from the works and it's essentially a foam sheet that you can cut into different shapes and sizes you can incise it, you can stitch it you can paint it and the leaves on um, Angelus have been made using funky foam right, um, right. So it's, it's if you've not used it before no I haven't it is really really I probably used it when I was doing style. you know being a scout leader and you know we have like uh, helping out with cubs cubs crafts yes. that kind of thing so yes. I, yeah I will have used it but I wouldn't, yes. wouldn't have thought to um put it's it in a bad. put it in a piece yeah, yeah. and you can, you can sew through it as well yeah you can sew through it you can and then when you stick it down you can bend it so if you're sticking a your leaf down for example you can stick one part of the leaf down and then another part but you can then push the leaf together so it looks organic you don't have to stick it down flat 
Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's very, very useful material to use. And the oranges in that piece are actually um, table tennis balls. <laughs> I had a, a very interesting afternoon sitting with these table tennis balls and gold paper and actually, you know, collaging them yeah. and then painting them gold. So, I mean, I do do some quite bizarre things sometimes. Yeah. I, mean, I even stitch in the car if, if obviously, I'm, not when I'm driving. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, or felting, I do little bits of felting in the car because I don't like to waste any time. So I just sit and, uh, you know, just just sew. Twiddle around. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think just going through those, just a, a small glimpse there of the materials, it really is bringing mixed media into it. You know, quite yeah. often I wonder to myself when people say, oh, yeah, I'm a mixed media. I think, well, what mixed media of what you know where kind of thing whereas it's really great for you to have um, unpicked as it were an image and say right that's made out of tennis balls that's made out of king's pan that's made out of so and so that's you know a melted rope or whatever that and that's really really great again it just helps us all visualize the fact that everything doesn't have to have been made out of french knots and chain stitch and you know etc etc it's you know really I think it's really interesting to see the range of kind of shapes and techniques and stuff and to hear you just talk about well you know this was a tennis ball and this was a thing so yeah thank you for that Nikki I think people find that really interesting good excellent now now the other thing was I wanted to come back to is so you mentioned there about your classes and helping people to have an image even though they can't draw etc etc now um I have to say that obviously last year we had the uh, dreaded lockdowns and pandemics and all the rest of it and we're still I think trying to escape all of that at the moment but uh, I'll be quite honest and say this Nikki Mm -hmm. that you became very visible so I saw you all (laughs) over the place um and you seem to have really and, and this is all in a I love online marketing that's that, that's my <laughs> actual business and so for me it was really great to see an artist like yourself really take the bull by the horns and say right this is me I'm here this is what I'm doing and we're going to give it a go on zoom I'm doing these things you were contacting groups and I don't know whether I just suddenly noticed you. I'd seen your work before, but last year, for some reason, you seem to be very, very visible, whether that's because you carried on doing that and others stopped and felt it wasn't an appropriate thing to do. Well, I, I don't know, but you were very visible. So do you want to just talk us through a bit about what that was all about and how how it's benefited you? And, you know, just that aspect of being an artist can be, I think, quite scary for a lot of people and they just you know say oh well I, I want to sit in a corner and do my stitching so yes. you know, do, you, do you mind talking us through that because I think people would find that very very inspiring as well so no, not at all um well like a lot of other artists I was really disappointed to have um lots of things but well everything really everything so, comes everything yeah. everything stopped and actually um I was inspired by a, a textile artist who I know that you've spoken to, Jessica Grady, yeah. who is, um, is, is a friend. We kind of contact each other from time to time. And she has had set up a, a webcam and she was doing some online talks and workshops. So I took a bit of advice from her and I bought myself a, a laptop and I bought myself a camera. Miraculously, I managed to get them to work because, again, I'm not very technical. Yeah. And, and, and I just went for it. So I yeah. thought, well... All of these embroidery guilds in these societies, they've got nothing going on at all. If there are people in those guilds who are willing to en- en- engage with technology and actually have Zoom talks, then I'm, I'm willing to, to provide yeah. them. So I actually sat for quite a long time and literally cut and pasted to every single embroidery guild yeah. in the country um, offering workshops. And I had a huge number from that. It was fantastic. I mean, I've got mm. a book here. The first one was on the 25th of August last year. And uh, up to now, I've done over 60, nearly 70 wow. different events, either talks or workshops, just schools, etc. And what's been fantastic is that initially I was holding work up in front of the camera. And then there was a lady, I think she was from Renfrewshire Embroiderers Guild. And she taught me through how to make a presentation on PowerPoint. And that was great because people were telling me and advising me on how to make the presentation better. So now I've got this quite slick presentation. Yeah. And I can share the PowerPoint with them, um, with viewers. 
And it's been fantastic. And in generally, each of the talks I've done, or a number of them have resulted in a Zoom workshop. So one thing really leads to another. And then I started to use Facebook to promote myself. So I'm following lots and lots of different pages. So if I put a page on uh, a post on Facebook, what I will normally do is share it. So this can take ages. And sometimes I've been doing something like 120 shares. Mm. And by doing that, I've been able to do some workshops, which I've been able to advertise worldwide, essentially. Yeah. So um, I've had a couple of people from um, America um, joining in and a lady from Australia, which would have been impossible. You know, it'd been unthinkable mm. 18 months ago. So it's really opened up. It's made the world smaller because the world can come to my Zoom room. I really like um, that approach. Now, it's a shame you didn't know me at the time. So I actually <laughs> helped a, a lot of artists last year do that very thing, get onto Zoom, understand how to, you know, and I, I created a, a course on doing that as well. And right. I've helped people to improve their process and improve how we can look at things and using an, an you know an, an, a phone as an extra camera and all that kind of stuff yeah, so yeah. you know I'd, I'd spent quite a lot of time last year as everyone started to panic last March um doing that and that's why our group uh my I, I'm in part of Hull Embroiders Guild or rather now we're called Hull and East Ride Embroiders um so I was running Zoom meetings I think we did our first one in the April and right. Uh, even on Saturday, it was our AGM of our new organisation. And one of the ladies said, thank you so much for doing that. It oh. really made a difference. And so yeah. we had monthly Zoom meetings. And I think everybody in the group would have, it was almost a new thing for all of them, um, as it has been for many people. But, you know, in some respects, you know, originally, if we just trying to do, when I've tried to talk to people about doing online stuff previous to that, I was like, oh, I can't do online. Oh, and I'm not yes. interested. Oh, it won't work. And I was going, no, honestly, it really will. No, no, no. But then you see people have the choice of, well, either you talk to nobody and you don't see your grandkids or you learn how to click on a link yes and attend a zoom it's yeah. not actually that hard it's not that difficult. Yeah. yeah so you know it's it for me from being mrs online person it was fascinating to watch the evolution and, and mm -hmm. i think i've shared this before that there's a lot of research was done and i think in six months the world took a, like a five-year leap in it's technology better. adaptation last year yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. unprecedented but yeah. yeah it was it was very very noticeable for somebody like me who notices online stuff uh, and yes I, I was one of those persons who got one of your uh, embroiderers guild uh, messages as well being a secretary <laughs> being the secretary of our branch as well so uh, you, were, you were already on my radar <laughs> yes um but yeah I think it just really goes to show and hopefully um a lot of people have learned even if it's been painful by trial and error or from learning from somebody like me then there's been, I think, the the textile art and embroidery world, I think, has actually been greatly enriched by this experience. I think it's one of the yes. good things to have come out of a damn awful situation. But, um, yeah, it's it's brought people together. And, yes. as you say, it's enabled us to connect more across the world you know, and a lot of stitching people have said, because they haven't done that before. Whereas for me, I've been working purely online for the last 11 years or whatever. So, right. you know, it, it's really, I, I found it been lovely that people have been able to make friends with people across the country and across the world through technology because they wanted to carry on doing stitching and things. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I find it, what, what's interesting about a Zoom presentation as well is that people can see the work close up obviously they don't get an idea of the scale of the work yeah, yeah but if I'm standing in a hall holding something up the lady at the back won't be able to see and you can't see anything at no. all you know and I've, I've often yeah. thought that and that I mean our group's only only small so we don't do those kind of talks but having attended some of them in the past I'll be frank I had really zero interest because you couldn't see okay. anything and you couldn't hear anything and it was just like why am I sitting here and I am going to be quite you know I'm, I'm Yorkshire I'm, I'm Yorkshire and I'm blunt I used to sit there thinking, why am I sitting here half listening to somebody telling me all about her sewing when actually I could be doing my own sewing because I don't really spend much time doing yes. it. 
go and you can all throw stones at me now <laughs> and switch off. <laughs> and the other interesting thing that I found with the Zoom presentation is if I'm doing an in-person one, I just show my work. Mm. But with the Zoom, I can put images of the things that have inspired me as well. Yes. So there's a little bit of, a, I think they're more educational. Mm. Um, so, you know, people have been very interested to, to learn things that they they didn't, they wouldn't find out from me if I was standing there in person. So that's been an interesting. It's been, um, um, it's a richer experience or it absolutely. can be. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Because I, I, I treat mine, it's an hour long presentation and mm. I treat mine as a sort of fasten your seatbelts, ladies. I mean, yeah. I take them to Persia and China and Japan and Italy and, and we kind of zoom all over the world through through different time zones, if you like. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I really enjoy delivering the talk. Fabulous. That's really great. So what would you say then has been, been the, the high point of your journey, your career so far in terms of textile art and embroidery then, Nikki? Well, I haven't had it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I haven't had it yet. I mean, I've had a lot of Still lovely... Still working up to it. Yes, yes. Um, I've had a lot of lovely exhibitions. So the, the one in Birkenhead was 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 very very pleasing. Uh, yeah. The Warthorpe one was as well. Mm. Um, I just feel, having done all these Zooms, I'm, I'm getting a lot more confidence in speaking to people. And what I'm looking forward to next year is the Chester exhibition, but also... Um, I'm taking part in a, a charity art fair, which happens every two years. And I've been asked to do a presentation about my work in front of about 60 people in the, in the town hall in Macclesfield. Yeah. And so it's things like that. And, mm-hmm. and I've been recommended to do that because somebody heard it in um, a U3A talk, I think. So, you know, I, I just like these opportunities cropping up. So and everything is exciting. You know, there's always something else around the corner. Um, I've got quite a few exhibition proposals in to various venues. I'm thinking about writing a book, for example, when I have time. Which seems... <laughs> <laughs> I've just got to decide which which angle to go for. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm I'm in the Embroidery Guild magazine. I've, I've had various uh, projects in Stitch magazine. Um, I've, I'm in Bank Maggie Gray's Wild Book Six and Seven. So things keep happening. I mean, it, it, more so at the moment, um, mm. you know, every day something seems to crop up. So, you know, the the, the best hopefully is yet to come, really. <laughs> right. And a lot of those things are a direct result of you putting yourself out there yes. and, put, and putting time into your business to make things happen. Yes. You know, definitely. it hasn't just all miraculously happened and fallen out of the sky. No, you've put a huge amount of work in yes. to get those results. And oh, I yes. think if anybody can take anything away from all of this, that's it. You know, you do spend a lot of time on that side of your business and yes. and you're getting the results out of it, yes. definitely. Well, yeah. the other thing is it's so easy to do now. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, years ago, take photographs, wait for a week for the photographs to come back, post them off, and then wait for them to be rejected or wait for a letter. Um, whether this time you've, I've got a presentation, I've got um, a proposal, just sap it off through an email, yeah. um, and it's instant. Yeah. So it's yeah. so much better, so much easier to to access people. It it truly is, and that that is. I'm, I'm really glad you made that point. It is everything, although people still say, oh, I can't do the technology, I can't do this, that and the other. It's all as easy as it ever has been. It's yes. never been as easy now for anything. Um, and so I think those kind of hurdles should be getting smaller and smaller and definitely, smaller. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just tend to... Um, to go for all sorts of different things I, I, as I say I've got I must have about six or seven proposals into various places and I just think until you ask you, you don't know do you so you no. might as well just um yes. just just send these off and you know be confident and um hopefully something will come back for you yeah fabulous no I think people found that really really inspiring um so I think really Nikki obviously we could talk all day and I, and, I, and I did vow to myself I wasn't going to say that and I've said it. So there we are. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so just as we kind of wrap up, really, I mean, you've mentioned in terms of future plans there, you've mentioned about you're involved with the exhibition and that's in June in, in June. Chester, yeah. Ca- Chester Cathedral. It's a cathedral, isn't it? Not a minster. Yeah, Ch- yes. Chester Cathedral. Um, the textile group is called Textile 21. Right. And the exhibition is called Odyssey. Odyssey. Ooh. Yes. So mine's about the journey of the wild swan. 
Yes, yes. And um, there's a picture of that. And on that, I really like the the text on there as well, because text, I think, can be quite difficult in, in artwork. Yes, yeah, I, I really like to things. use it. I mm. like to use it as a focal point, actually. So I, I do yeah. use it quite frequently. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I have. I have noticed that, but that's a lovely example of um, of the text complementing the it's a, the swan and the wildlife and stuff. Yeah, yes. I really, I really like that one. So, oh, always... so that's exciting then. Uh, let me just get this right. Is that finished now, or have you got other work to do for that as well? The wild swan is finished. Yeah. Um, there's the, the second image is called the Conference of the Birds, which oh, is oh, that's a, it. It's the triptych, isn't it? Yes. Silly me. There's three pieces, yes. and then the, the third piece is called the, the Simorg, S I M O R G H, which yeah. is the mythical bird that the Conference of the Birds go to find. It's quite a it's quite yeah. an interesting story, which involves religion and sort of self revelation and things like that. So it's um, and the, as I say, the swan links all of the images together. So you'll have to go to Chester to see the finish. There. Yes. Well, actually, oh, is it the start of June? I'm just wondering whether the, the I'm, I'm normally there with some friends for the Wits and Tide weekend. So I might be there a week too early. Yeah, uh, I think it's up at the very start of June. Yeah. I'll have to send you some photos. <laughs> yeah, no, that'll be absolutely fantastic. So we've got that look to, to look forward to. You are thinking about a book. So yes. that's obviously um, an interesting project in there. And other than other than that, you know, because obviously you've got nothing else to do. <laughs> Have you got anything else that, to just finish off with there, Nikki? Um, well, I'm working on another piece at the moment, uh, just briefly. Um, Textile 21 are going to mount an exhibition about colour. So at the moment, amongst all the other things, I'm investigating <laughs> The red list, which is looking at animals and birds and creatures that oh, yes. are endangered. Yeah, yeah. So um, just keep just keep looking is all I can say. Just uh, keep yeah. looking and enjoy yourselves, really. Yeah, and um, I, I just love it. Yeah, fabulous. And so Facebook is a good place for us all to go and follow you on there. So we'll, yes, yeah, we'll Nikki Palmenta. Yeah, Nikki Palmenta Artworks. Artwork on Facebook, right? Fabulous. Yes. yes. Okey dokey. And of course, if you're involved, anybody listening um, with any sort of group, then obviously you know that Nikki in particular likes doing Zoom workshops and things. So, you know, if you're the other side of the world, it doesn't matter. She's got really good practice at uh, doing this now. So there we are. Right. Do you know what? I've really, really enjoyed speaking to you. It, as I say, it's been in a while since I've done any uh, any episodes. So this has been a really bright and colourful and cheerful one to uh, to get started with as well. And I'm kind of looking forward to, to putting these back online again. So I've got quite an interesting list of contrasting guests and topics as well, which I'm sure everybody will find pretty interesting. So there we are. I think with that being said... That's it for today. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's really been wonderful speaking to you. And I'm glad that we finally, we finally got together. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Bye. Okay. Bye, Steve. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and information around this podcast. Please visit stitcherystories.com. Of course, you can listen to Stitchery Stories on plenty of podcast apps at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and plenty more besides. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Stitchery Stories podcast too. But wherever you listen, why not leave us a rating and a review? to encourage other people to listen to. I very much appreciate you taking the time to do that for me. So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. Keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.